Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morphine. Oops, sorry. Well, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, you know, when when I mention when when I say incremental hemodialysis, I think everybody has different ideas. Uh, we oftentimes think about dialysis done less frequently. We sometimes think about dialysis. Uh, done for a shorter period of time per treatment. I think it's all of that. Um, but I think uh, the best way to define incremental hemodialysis is the application of hemodialysis with consideration and maybe prioritization of residual kidney function. We can approach it in different ways. Uh, I have no uh, financial disclosures relevant to this talk. We're not going to talk about any um, off-label use of medications here. So a few learning objectives. I think we're going to um, really focus on the residual kidney function part because that's really what allows us to consider the application of incremental hemodialysis. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, how often hemodialysis patients have residual kidney function. This has been very well described. Um, we're going to kind of mention a little bit about the residual kidney function and how it's associated with various clinical outcomes, including mortality, and uh, kind of go through some processes of maybe identifying those who may be candidates for incremental hemodialysis and touch upon a few of the uh, studies we've done here. Um, the out the outline of the talk, we're going to just start with uh, clinical outcomes. I'm going to kind of look at how long residual renal function lasts in hemodialysis patients. Uh, we're going to talk about how the frequency of hemodialysis may affect residual renal function in uh, in-center hemodialysis patients, um, who to consider for incremental hemodialysis, um, how to measure residual renal function, and probably more recently, ways of potentially estimating residual kidney function in hemodialysis patients, much like what we do with the CKD epi equations and MDRD equations of estimating renal function in CKD patients. And I'm going to uh, touch upon the challenges of uh, prescribing incremental hemodialysis. Um, as many of you know, um, about 40% of uh, incident hemodialysis patients start with an estimated GFR of uh, greater than 15%, uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the 10 to 15%, I should say. And uh, this is based on purely CKD epi equations on the last creatinine prior to starting hemodialysis. So rarely is uh, residual renal function measured at the time of starting dialysis, so we really can't translate to this to fact. Um, if you look at some of the uh, prospective uh, observational studies, the CHOICE study random, uh, 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 included uh, over 700 patients recruited from the mid-1990s to late-1990s, followed for five years. This was a U.S. hemodialysis population from 19 centers around the country. Um, and uh, at incident dialysis, uh, the patients were, sorry, patients were asked one question. They were asked, do you make more than one cup of urine a day, meaning greater than 250 cc's? And with yes or no answer to that question, it's a self-reported answer in that not all patients had urine volumes measured. And uh, based on that, they were classified as having residual uh, renal function or not. Um, at time zero, even though there was a trend, there was no uh, significant difference in mortality given that. Now at one year's time, the patients were asked that same question and then reclassified. And based on those that did answer that they did have more than one cup of urine output, they had a lower all-cause mortality. Uh, a subset of these patients, uh, about 300 of the 700, actually had urine volumes measured. And of, of those who said that they made more than a cup of urine a day, the median urine volume was 720 cc's. And for those who said that they made less 
than a couple of urine, which is about 250 cc's. The median was 420 cc's. So patients are really not very good at estimating how much urine they actually make. So we may need to actually do formal measurements. And I think another important part of this study was at incident hemodialysis, about 80% of patients starting hemodialysis said that they had residual renal function of greater than 250 cc's a day. So we can look at another uh, prospective uh, cohort of uh, incident hemodialysis patients. This is from the Netherlands. And uh, the important finding here is that they, all patients had residual renal function measured, formally measured. And for all levels of decreasing levels of residual renal function, there was a higher relative risk of death. So residual renal function was really important. And in patients that had any degree of residual renal function, applying more dialysis clearance was not associated with mortality. You may wonder why those patients with no residual renal function actually had lower mortality with more hemodialysis is because if you actually look at the details of the study, um, a big proportion of those patients with no residual renal function were well under dialyzed given present standards. But this does suggest that there's a graded effect of residual renal function in terms of benefits for, uh, in terms of mortality. And I think we intrinsically know this from the uh, PD literature that for a similar level of urea clearance, dialyzer versus what you get out of the native kidneys, the kidneys give you more benefit. And uh, this study by um, Sheldon Leong, working with Dr. Meyer and Surich out of Stanford, um, they looked at nine uh, three times a week anuric hemodialysis patients and compared them with nine twice weekly hemodialysis patients who had residual renal function. And they focused on some of these more protein bound, poorly dialyzable solutes. And to interpret this, um, they took the uh, solute removal of these substances that were removed and measured their dialyzer clearance and normalized it to the amount of urea removed by, by uh, the dialysis and similarly did it for residual renal function. And how to interpret this is, for example, for a HIP rate, you only get about 50% of the clearance that you get from urea clearance with the dialyzer. And you can compare this, for example, for a HIP rate, the um, native kidney removes eight times as much HIP rate as it does urea removal. So there are clearly things that are important from an excretion perspective of the native kidneys that the, that the uh, artificial membrane cannot do. And some of the other uh, associated benefits of residual renal function in hemodialysis patients include better electrolyte control, fluid gains, lower ESA dosing required to obtain the same level of hemoglobin, better vitamin D metabolism, lower uh, levels of inflammatory markers, and overall patients are um, reporting better uh, self-reported quality of life. So none of this probably matters much if residual renal function goes away in the first month or two of hemodialysis. Um, so what do, what do we know about this in terms of the durability of residual renal function in in-center hemodialysis patients? Well, we can get some information from what we know from the peritoneal dialysis literature. Um, the Canada-USA study um, uh, looked at incident peritoneal dialysis patients, and the kind of highlighted region looked at the um, standard weekly KTRV from residual renal function, and there was a, a, a steady decline over the course of the two-year follow-up, and you lost a little bit over half of residual renal function in these PD patients uh, over the course of two years. 
and in some um, retrospective studies, for example, this one out of the University of Missouri, uh, looking at 100 human in-center human incident hemodialysis patients, and what did I say? Okay, I'm sorry. And I'm looking at uh, 40 in-center hemodialysis patients with residual renal function measured. The uh, loss of residual renal function appeared to be uh, appeared to occur at a higher rate for those on uh, in-center hemodialysis. But is this universally true? If again, if you look at the Netherlands study where residual renal function was measured longitudinally in these incident hemodialysis patients, you can see that uh, about 90% uh, of patients had residual renal function at three months. And similarly, at about two years, about half of patients uh, seem to have lost their residual renal function. And if you look at the uh, weekly K uh, weekly standard KTRV, the decline here is actually very similar to what we saw in the Canada-USA study for peritoneal dialysis patients. So certainly in various applications where um, perhaps the, the prescription of hemodialysis in the Netherlands is slightly different than that in the United States, and uh, if you look at the details of the uh, Netherlands studies, uh, there was a higher percentage of patients that were started on twice weekly hemodialysis compared with what we traditionally see in the United States. So we kind of looked at this ourselves. Um, and it's important to know that in our DCI clinics, we've been checking residual kidney function in all hemodialysis patients. We've been doing this for over three decades. And our criteria is this. If a um, patient turns in a urine volume of less than 100 cc's for that 24 hours, or if the patient self-reports that they no longer make urine, then we deem them anuric. Otherwise, we would like to continue to measure their 24-hour urine collection um, every three months until they meet some of, the, uh, some of those criteria for anuria. So we really have about three to 4,000 24-hour urine collections. And uh, so I recently, we recently took um, about 400 incident hemodialysis patients who were on three times a week dialysis at this, at from the very beginning of their dialysis career. And uh, this encompassed uh, over 1,000 urine collections. And, we t and these were patients with at least two urine collections over time. And we did some statistical things, uh, principal components analysis, and we modeled what the 24-hour urine uh, uh, your volume output would look like potentially for a patient on three times a week hemodialysis. And it does seem to suggest that the residual renal function lasts a little bit longer than maybe what we all thought um, in, in, uh, but based on the limited literature from before. Now we were interested in looking at the first six months because for a couple reasons, there seemed to be a very rapid decline in the first six months. And number two, this first six months of dialysis is also very, um, it's, a, it's a vulnerable period for these, uh, for instant hemodialysis patients with a very high uh, mortality rate. So we looked at a, a 106 um, uh, instant hemodialysis patients with at least with, with two urine collections within that first six months. And we looked at the degree of change in urea clearance over that period of time. If you took the, if you took the average of all this, and each horizontal line represents a patient, if you average it out, it, it indeed, the overall um, uh, finding would be that you do lose residual urea clearance. But surprisingly, about a third of patients actually increased their urea clearance between the first collection and their second collection within six months. And actually, when you think about it, this isn't too surprising. We know that about 5% of patients starting on um, in-center hemodialysis deemed ESRD um, through Medicare actually recover renal function and are able to get off of dialysis within the first 12 months of starting dialysis. And uh, Ann O'Hare looked at a cohort of uh, VA patients and looked at the, the pattern of change in renal function prior to starting dialysis, and she found a, um, 
a group that uh, seemed to have a very rapid decline in renal function prior to starting dialysis, and oftentimes starting dialysis at a much higher estimated GFR than the average individual. And uh, if you think about it, these are probably individuals who start dialysis because of volume overload or cardiorenal syndrome. And with the two to three months of dialysis, you actually can have improvement of the residual renal function. So this informs us that perhaps the moment that insulin patients start hemodialysis may not be the perfect time to check that residual renal function and make a firm determination of what the residu residual renal function really will be, um, but to continue to be vigilant about it over the first six months of dialysis. So if uh, residual renal function in hemodialysis is associated with so many important positive outcomes and may seem to last a little bit longer than what we all thought, um, what can we do to keep that residual renal function going? Um, most of these are perhaps strategies or ways translated from how we take care of CKD patients. Um, it's a lot of it is observational, some of it is anecdotal, and uh, much of it is probably speculative. Um, but what we know is uh, renal angiotensin system blockade is associated with uh, longer lasting residual kidney function in peritoneal dialysis patients, and there is some hint that it's true for hemodialysis patients as well. Um, uh, kind of theoretically, we would want to minimize toxin exposure to patients that have residual renal function even if they have started dialysis. Um, and the last three, the biocompatibility of dialysis membranes, exposure to clean water, and avoiding volume depletion or hypertension may be relevant as we look at the frequency of hemodialysis and its potential effects on residual renal function. So uh, we can first get an idea of potentially what increasing the frequency of dialysis affect, how it may affect residual renal function by looking at the frequent hemodialysis network trials. Remember there were two arms, conventional treatment versus daily in-center. And in that uh, daily in-center, they had about five treatments a week versus three for the conventional. And then the second arm was uh, the conventional thrice weekly uh, compared with frequent nocturnal dialysis. Again, also about five treatments a week compared to about three treatments a week. Um, importantly, the uh, majority of patients in the conventional versus daily in-center um, did not have substantial residual renal function, but majority did have residual renal function in the conventional versus frequent nocturnal um, arm of the study. So what were the outcomes? Um, the uh, frequent in-center versus conventional uh, thrice weekly hemodialysis, while there was a loss of residual renal function in both groups, it was not statistically significant. Um, but remember, there was a majority of patients did not have some significant residual renal function in that arm. Uh, if you look at the um, frequent hemodialysis, frequent nocturnal group, versus conventional hemodialysis, there was a um, greater decline in residual renal function in the frequent nocturnal group than in the conventional hemodialysis group. Remember, majority of patients in that arm of the, tr of the uh, study did have substantial re residual renal function at the start of dialysis. So uh, while it, we, we can't say for sure, <coughs> excuse me, um, what to make of this, um, there is pot potentially a hint that uh, more intensive hemodialysis, however you want to describe that, uh, may be associated with more rapid loss of residual renal function. We really don't have much other data to go by. So is the opposite true? If we do less than three times a week dialysis, is it associated with better preservation of residual kidney function? And I think the best answer is we really don't know. Um, but um, uh, Dr. Ovi in, um, from 
Cam Kalantar's group down in UC Irvine recently did this study. They took, um, they looked at the, through the DaVita database, they looked at uh, um, incident hemodialysis patients that had residual renal function who lived for at least 12 months. So they took so somewhat of a more healthy cohort of incident hemodialysis patients. Um, and uh, they started with 70,000 incident hemodialysis patients, 24,000 lived for at least 12 months. And out of that, they were only, and, and they needed patients that had residual renal function measured. Out of that many patients, they only identified 351 patients that were started on twice weekly hemodialysis with residual renal function. So I think that tells you how infrequently this process is done in the United States. And they did, um, they did some really nice um, matched controls to identify an 8,000 patient cohort of conventional thrice weekly hemodialysis population who also had longitudinal residual renal function measured. And the, uh, there was, a, there, both groups started at a similar level of residual renal function and the um, incremental or the twice weekly hemodialysis groups seemed to have lost residual renal function at a slower rate than those that were on um, conventional three times a week hemodialysis. This is all retrospective. This was a cohort from 2007 to 2010. So it, it gives us a hint. It doesn't really um, give us a conclusion about this, about this idea that less frequent is associated with um, slower decline, but I think the I think the 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 signal is there. So, what do we know about actually doing twice a week dialysis and patient outcomes? Well, we know even less. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is DOPS data. Remember, DOPS data looks at prevalent hemodialysis patients, not incident patients. So we have to take that into account. And we look at the various countries, and uh, if you look at that very, very bottom dark bar, that's the percentage of patients that are starting, uh, that are on less than three times a week hemodialysis, and we're talking about 3% in the United States, even lower in some of the other countries, um, um, China and actually India in some recent publications have a very high percentage of patients that are on twice weekly hemodialysis. But what we know is residual renal function is not measured in any of those um, uh, countries or in, this in, the, in the published studies. And a lot of the twice weekly hemodialysis patients are on that schedule born out of financial issues and not necessarily based on clinical reasons. So if you look at what is out there in terms, and all this is retrospective data, um, if you look at what's published in terms of um, clinical outcomes in incident hemodialysis patients started on twice weekly, again, all retrospective, um, it paints perhaps a little bit more of a cautionary tale. Uh, if you look at the study out of the United States, there was no difference. If you look at the study out of China, there was no difference between twice versus three times a week hemodialysis patients. If you look at the study out of Lithuania, um, lower levels of um, lower frequencies of hemodialysis was, was associated with increased mortality. These are purely observational retrospective studies, so we really um, can't conclude anything based on this. Again, this is out of uh, Dr. Obi's study using the DaVita database and that same cohort, of the same matched cohort and um, they did not find um, a difference in mortality after following up for, a, uh, for about five years in the twice weekly versus three times a week incident hemodialysis patient start populations. So we should be considered if we are to approach the start of dialysis with this idea of um, considering residual renal function um, Dr. Kalantar and other um, experts in the field published uh, some basic guidelines for uh, individuals who may be appropriate to start on a twice a week regimen. Um, they mentioned at least 500 cc's or half a liter of urine output a day, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
Um, if you look at all the other criteria, they're basically describing a stable hemodialysis patient. So we were wondering, um, well, if we looked at all our instant start hemodialysis patients, especially since we have residual renal function um, data on uh, all patients who are willing to return urine to us, um, uh, how many of these three times a week start patients could have theoretically started twice a week and have done reasonably well? So this was more of a thought experiment, if you will. So we looked at uh, 14 years of incident hemodialysis patients. So we really looked at patients that also survived for six months or more. So we're trying to, trying to look at a stable cohort. Um, and they had to have urine collection data. And these were all individuals who, from the get-go, were prescribed three times a week hemodialysis. And um, we looked at a lot of um, uh, data that we had. And the, we, we, we finally boiled it down to about 410 patients that were considered stable dialysis patients on three times a week that we could examine in detail. So we had some criteria that we wanted to put in place before saying, yeah, this many or this proportion of those patients could have done um, twice weekly dialysis safely. Um, obviously, we're all interested in small molecule clearance. So um, when we're talking about adding residual renal function to dialyzer clearance, um, I think the best way to do it is to um, use uh, standard weekly KTRV. So we um, looked at um, delivering 2.3 volumes for these um, patients. Um, we, s we s figured that no patient would want to stay on dialysis for longer than four hours. So we used a four hour per treatment on a twice weekly basis as a theoretical maximum duration of dialysis. And we're all interested in ultrafiltration rates these days. So we kind of said, well, if the theoretical fluid management will require a UF rate on these theoretical twice a week dialysis of greater than um, 13 cc's per kilogram per hour, well, they may not be the best for twice a week hemodialysis. And we looked at their present hemodynamics and side effects on dialysis and figured, well, the patient on three times a week is already having lots of problems. Well, maybe they're not great for going to twice a week. So we put those criteria in into a fairly complex computer algorithm and we made some other assumptions, which I can go through um, a little later on. Um, but the basic results are out of those 410, about a quarter of them could have really been quite optimally started on twice a week hemodialysis and, and sorry. And uh, if you look at what the uh, residual renal function was, um, the group that was optimal had essentially a standard KTRV of one, which is kind of about half of what you would minimally like them to get anyways uh, to, um, on, uh, for their total weekly clearance, um, the group that was appropriate was able to uh, achieve adequacy. And we kind of estimated if they were on twice a week dialysis for the optimal group, they would just need two hours of treatment twice a week to meet the uh, small molecule clearance goals. The group that was appropriate but had some limitations due to ultrafiltration um, would need about a three hour treatment and still be well within the parameters of small molecule clearance. And even those that were not ideal um, would probably have done okay if they were on in center nocturnal dialysis twice a week, but they would have required over six hours of treatment to achieve small molecule, adequate small molecule clearance. And I should note that the, um, the middle column, the appropriate for two times a week dialysis was mostly limited by the ultrafiltration rate. If you look at the bottom row, um, only about half the patients would have theoretically been able to get below that 13 cc's per kilogram per hour of UF. But we also noted that only 40% of these patients were actually on, on diuretics. So diuretics were well underused and could have pushed some of these patients to um, being 
probably optimal for twice weekly. So, in con so when we looked at it, about half of patients clearly had um, adequate small molecule clearance to be able to do twice a week hemodialysis with some limitations in, a co in, in, in half of those um, uh, due to volume control. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit about measuring versus estimating residual renal function. All our urine data is measured, and we mostly do a 24-hour um, urine collection. I think if you were to get to, to try to figure out the best way, I would suggest a long urine collection in the entire interdialytic period, but uh, that's very impractical. So most studies that have looked at residual renal function have done either a 24 or 48-hour urine collection. Um, how it's done is pretty straightforward, actually. They, you ask the patient to collect the urine. You hope they do it right. Um, they bring in the urine. The um, lab technician takes the urine and puts it through a graduated cylinder, records the volume, sends off an aliquot for urea or cranium. The tricky part is actually determining what blood urea nitrogen level to use to calculate the clearance. Remember the whole UV divided by P equation. Um, and there are some adjustments that you can make um, for that pre-dialysis of the UN to make it appropriate for that particular urine collection. And it depends on both the duration of the urine collection as well as which interdialytic period you've done the urine collection. I won't go through that. That's sort of a topic of itself. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's a r collecting and measuring residual renal function is not terribly expensive because the only additional lab test is the sending out the 24, the aliquot of urine out to the lab. Um, it does involve a little bit more process changes within the dialysis unit and you just have to buy a graduated cylinder. Um, but, but, but it does add a degree of hassle, a degree of extra work in an already busy hemodialysis unit. So many investigators have looked at ways of estimating residual renal function in a hemodialysis population. And uh, this group out of the UK looked at um, th uh, traditional markers like urea and creatinine, but they also looked at some non-traditional markers like beta-2 microglobulin and cystatin C. Um, their model for um, beta-2 microglobulin was the best for discriminating a residual kidney urea clearance as greater than or equal to, or, uh, greater than or equal to two cc's per minute. Um, Dr. Shafi out of, um, out of Dr. Koresh's group in Johns Hopkins um, published this a few years ago, and they also used some non-traditional um, serum markers to develop their models. They looked at uh, cystatin C, beta trace protein, and beta-2 microglobulin and uh, they had a reasonable uh, area under the curve, the best one for their combined beta trace protein and beta-2 microglobulin model. So we, we th thought, well, you know, these kind of uh, non-traditional biomarkers would be additional blood tests, additional cost. You know, we, we were not so sure that it would be practically implementable. Um, so since we had so much urine, we developed some models of our own. So we looked, we, uh, using 400 patients and their incident hemodialysis patients and their urine collection within the first three months of dialysis, we developed some models. I have to kind of um, give credit to uh, Dr. Heejin Bang in the uh, Department of Public Health for, and she's very, very, um, experience with model building and she spent she and I spent a lot of time building these models and we used essentially factors that you could easily get for our model one was simply using urine urine um, volume alone knowing what the 24 hour urine volume was uh, model two which we predicted to be our best would use urine volume and a bunch of kind of readily available clinical factors and the model three is what where we figured, okay, if, if you're not going to even collect urine, well, what can you, what, if you use other basic readily available clinical factors, how well can you predict what the residual urea clearance is? And our goal, our, our, our cutoff was greater than or equal to 2.5 milliliters per minute. I think in, when we refine this, I may choose 3.0 mils per minute because that's been more of in the literature. So how do these models do? 
we validated it in uh, 206 um, different unique patient uh, and urine pairs. And uh, these were also insulin and hemodialysis patients. And uh, our urine alone volume actually gave a pretty good um, area under curve for, di uh, for discriminating uh, urea clearance as greater than 2.5. Um, our best model was kind of what we would predicted. It did great. Um, and even our model that did not use the 24-hour urine collection did reasonably well as a potential screening tool. So what are the challenges for prescribing for mental hemodialysis? I think we all know what the challenges are. Um, it's, it's a lot of it is ourselves. We know that our patients are most vulnerable in their first 90 days of starting dialysis, and we are always thinking that more is better <laughs> when it comes to hemodialysis. So we may be very reluctant to consider going to an uh, incremental um, dialysis modality. Um, there is a perception that residual kidney function declines very rapidly in hemodialysis patients. Hopefully I've shown some data to the contrary. Um, most, and the most important thing is most hemodialysis clinics don't check residual renal function. It's estimated that less than 5% of in-center hemodialysis patients in the United States ever get their 24-hour urine, um, uh, their residual renal function checked. Um, if you, if you uh, approach incremental dialysis by decreasing time, but keeping them on a three times a week um, schedule, um, you're gonna blow it with a QIP because oftentimes your delivered single pool KTRV on dialysis is gonna be below the 1.2 minimum. Um, and there's been much emphasis on time on dialysis. And we, we talked a little bit about ultrafiltration. And obviously there's some scheduling constraints. And I'm gonna have a few slides on scheduling. So if you want to do twice a week dialysis, you kind of want to space out the treatments as optimally as possible, which means that you're going to have a three-day gap and then a four-day gap, right? If you, if you, unfortunately, you have an odd number of days in a week. So um, traditionally, you would put them on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule and put them on on Monday and Friday, or a TTS schedule and put them on a Tuesday or Saturday. Now, you know, many would argue that takes up a whole slot, you've wasted a couple of um, chairs on Wednesdays and Thursdays respectively. Now you can get the same spacing by using a Monday and Thursday, a Tuesday or Friday, a Wednesday or Saturday. So it's kind of these non-traditional types of schedule. Well, how can that help you? Well, if you look at your ideal four times a week hemodialysis schedule, the, 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 the schedules on the bottom there, you have your Monday, Wednesday, Friday with an extra on Saturday, a Monday, Tuesday, uh, a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday with an extra on Monday for your four times a week dialysis patients. And you theoretically could use the empty spots there and get an ideally spaced twice a week spot. So I actually t looked at earlier in the week, I took from one of our dialysis clinics, uh, we have 96 patients, we have 14 patients on four times a week dialysis. These are their actual schedules. And just with their present schedules, and, and the idea is keeping the patients on the same shift as well on twice a week, we have already have three spots for twice a week dialysis that's evenly spaced without taking up any new patient slots. So there are ways around this. And finally, what's important for our patients? Um, you know, what's important for future trials in hemodialysis? Well, how do you find that out? You take 200 patients, 1,000 professional he health care givers, put them in the same room, patient individuals from 73 countries, and they come up with this. And this puts in priorities in terms of what's important for the patients and for the um, uh, health givers. And if you look at, unfortunately, oh, sorry, fortunately it's a little bit blurry on the slide, but dialysis adequacy, vascular access issues, dialysis frequency, washed out after dialysis feeling are in the top six or seven. And all these things, all, all of these could potentially be addressed with less frequent hemodialysis in the appropriate patient. So conclusions, very few insulin patients um, get uh, residual kidney function evaluated, and I think we can do better. Um, 
we've kind of approached the target adequacy as a fixed target rather than a variable target, and I think we should look at a variable target because we know that for a given CC per, c uh, per minute of dialyzer clearance versus residual kidney clearance, that residual kidney clearance is worth tons more. And um, incremental start in uh, hemodialysis patients in appropriate patients um, needs to be more thoroughly reviewed. So um, last thing I want to say is dialysis should be, we talk about prescribing dialysis, so we should prescribe dialysis like any other medication that you have to look at the dose and frequency of that medication that to be appropriate for that patient's clinical scenario. This is the number of new publications in um, with the keywords residual kidney function and hemodialysis over the past few years. Thank you very much.